Thank you, whoever uh, rang the mobile phone to alert us that it is uh, time to start our session. It's, it's a uh, late 20th century admonition to silence our own phones as we turn towards the 21st century in this afternoon's session on pioneering the future of governance in the Arab world. And this is an opportunity for the next 45 minutes to do a deep dive in particular to hear what's going on uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, my name is Jonathan Zittrain. I normally teach on internet law and policy at Harvard University. My own introduction to some of the efforts going uh, on in the UAE was actually when I heard of a project in 2009 where there were efforts to build a robot that would be the world's first robot capable of interacting uh, with people in the Arabic language. And it was a simulcrum of Ibn Sina, the 11th century polymath, who could then interact uh, more contemporaneously uh, with people at expositions and through virtual reality. That was already almost 10 years ago, and a lot has happened since. And we have three ministers from UAE here in a series of presentations. This is one of the few zones of the annual meeting where we are actually permitted slides uh, and other forms of presentation. So we're going to hear from each of our guests, have a chance to have a conversation a little bit, and then open it up more generally to the room. So uh, may I first welcome Minister Sarah bin Yusuf al-Amiri, uh, who is Minister of State for Advanced Sciences, and really interested to hear what you have to say. And before you start, pause. Maybe you can uh, just say a word or two before you start about uh, when you were in your teens, when you were young, was this your aspiration? Were you thinking about the sciences and thinking about uh, a high government post uh, at that time? Not a high government post per se. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for making it here. But more importantly, looking up at the stars and wondering about the potential uh, that this world that we're living on can actually hold and foster for growth um, for all. And that is what has translated into what I'm working on on the Emirates Mars mission, but also working on shaping policy for science and utilizing science as a great transformative um, testbed for our civilization. We come from a region, you just mentioned Ibn Sina, that was the cradle of scientific discovery, that was the cradle of um, exploration. And um, it's good to walk through that journey. Um, it's, it's very much a, a story of me growing up um, through that nation. Well, I don't want to be the one standing between us and hearing about the mission to Mars. Please take it away. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. A few years ago, we stood on a stage and announced the aspiration to go to Mars. This aspiration is something that is quite out of the blue when people um, initially thought of it. This is the Arab world's first mission. It's going to be launched in July of 2020 with arrival to Mars in early 2021 and start of science in August of 2021. Our government, when they set such an aspirational goal, one of their key drivers was to develop our scientific and technological advancement and our capabilities, and more importantly, feed it towards our economic development and also towards the development and sustainable growth and finding solutions to key challenges that we're, fo we're facing as a nation and the world is facing, facing as a whole, such as climate change, availability and access to water and so on. So how does a mission to Mars play in that? The same way that a teenage me stood and looked up at the stars, it's about aspiration. It's about breaking all boundaries and it's about breaking all limitations that are self-imposed on us as we grow up year after year. It's about intriguing that belief in exploration that we were all born with as humanity and that we need to carry forward. One of our key drivers for this mission, something that the Prime Minister stressed on directly, is not to send a piece, a piece of space junk to Mars to check a box of going to Mars and capturing an image. We had a very strong imperative of having valuable scientific contribution to the global aspirations of, a, of understanding our neighbor, of understanding the climate change that occurred on that planet and the transformation that has occurred on that planet. Studying our neighbor will help us better understand what is occurring here on Earth. And that's where the driver of this mission went. This mission is about understanding the climate change on the planet Mars 
Mars is losing its atmosphere, but more importantly, it's losing hydrogen and oxygen. Building block of water, this is the building block of life here on Earth. And it's better understanding of the continuation of that. But more importantly also is understanding how the weather system on Mars occurs. Previously, the amount of data that we've had about the planet is when you step outside here on Earth, pick two random locations, and then pick the temperature throughout, scattered throughout the entire year. Our data is new because it provides a holistic understanding of that planet rather than providing the fragmented understanding that currently exists about Mars. This is very valuable to the scientific community internationally, and it's not by our own accolades stating that. It has been driven largely by a scientific body that sets the key questions that we currently don't have a mission toward. Uh, we don't have a mission built toward answering. But moving over from there, I said initially that we want to develop both, both scientific and technical capability. This is where the mission is at at the moment. This is the spacecraft. This is the actual spacecraft body that's going to Mars. It's currently undergoing um, testing for fit out with a lot of the applications. You'll see around images of, of our three instruments that will provide us that understanding and that global view of the Martian um, atmosphere. Will provide us both images, but also provide us valuable ultraviolet and infrared data that scientists really require. We're going to provide them with more than 100 gigabytes of data that will be freely available to the public without holding it on for any period of time, just to verify that the data is correct. People is the foundation of the growth of the UAE. The UAE invested in its people, invested in education over the last 46 years and will continue to do that. The real wealth of, an, of our nation, as our founding father said, is the people, are the people who make that grow. It's not the buildings, it's not the oil, it's not the materialistic things that we're working on. And this team is made up of international collaboration. Again, the UAE uh, pushes and strive, strives towards having positive diplomacy and a positive impact around the world. We are working very closely with the University of Colorado in, Bo in Boulder, University of California in Berkeley, and Arizona State University alongside our team. I'd like to point out a few important things. If you see the percentage of women is quite high for a space mission here. We are 40% women. The average age of the team is 27 years old. Let that resound in an industry that people are saying is quite aging um, and developing that way. And this is a strong driver to the UAE. Every woman that is there is not there because I have a quota to fill or the project manager has a quota to fill. They are there because they have proved themselves. They've reached to a point where they are beyond being empowered as women in society and being valuable contributors to the development of the UAE as a whole. This mission has been named Hope. And this, and today at WEF, uh, the, the opening statement is fractured world. How do we create a shared future in this fractured world? Youth in the Arab reg region makes up 108, over 108 million. To put that into perspective, that is the population of South Korea and South Africa put together. That's how much energy exists within this, this region that expands um, coasts. That's how much energy that could be used positively to impact change, but also, and we see that a lot, in the most fractured place around the world, in the Middle East, it's used negatively to push, towards, uh, to push, to push youth towards um, extremism. We are here today to provide several statements of hope, of agile governance, of a way to evolve and include youth in the decision-making process. The UAE does not only speak that in titles, does not only say that it's going to Mars or elsewhere just by making bold statements. It's making bold statements, but creating examples of youth that are behind those statements. This team, which we're all under 34 years old, has been given such a monumental challenge that is at the international scene, and that's getting to Mars by the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you. Please, Sarah, thank you so much for what we say in the sciences was an extremely high signal to noise ratio, five minutes. Hopefully not, hopefully, hopefully not a destructive one. Not at all. <laughs> um, and just a, a couple questions uh, to warm us up. The first, in undertaking something of this magnitude and depth and novelty, how do you decide what to try to develop and cultivate in-house within that team versus what to try to farm out and say, well, we'll go to this outside contractor or this outside partner country yeah. for the expertise or the technology or the module. How do you decide? 
it's like any other project. Each project has a certain driver. Ours was time. We needed to develop a mission in under seven years. That's how much time we've been given to develop that mission. And also the factor of having a constrained budget because we want to transform the way that, uh, that those projects are being run. And therefore, those were the key decision points. On top of that, we had key strategic um, scientific and technical capabilities that we needed to transcend. So we're talking about not only developing our space sector, but having all the spillovers that will come to key sectors. So the decision was which ones has the highest impact, allows us to come on time, does not exceed our budget. Very simple yes. math that goes, uh, th that goes there and gives you that answer yes. of buy versus build versus develop capabilities and so on. Um, and we continuously do that moving forward. Yes. We also make decisions when it, it's, it's a buy decision, but it's something that is of interest to us. In parallel, the team is developing something uh, that, that may not be used on this spacecraft. And we also include the private sector in developing some of the pieces. Again, they may not be at a point where they can yes. be used on this particular spacecraft, but they will be able to use them in other spacecraft and more importantly, spill over into the aviation and aerospace yes. sector, which is key to our economy. Now, you mentioned making decisions and we make decisions. We have governance in the title of the session. So let's talk for a moment about the internal governance of a project like this. Does the buck stop at your desk? And I can imagine, you know, sometimes projects like these cost more and take longer than initially anticipated. It's been known to happen. Is so it? I yes. have the pleasure of not having that burden. <laughs> that uh -huh. stops at the project manager, Omran Sharaf. So that's where uh, the decisions are. We also have a strong driver from the UAE Space Agency uh, that oversees the entire mission development. Uh, the team is made, so it's a, it's a pretty consultative team. The team is made up of deputy project managers, myself in charge of science, and every single, so every part of the spacecraft and subsystem has a voice with regards to decision making. Um, and uh, we all share the burden of getting the UAE to Mars. Got it. Last question, spacefaring in particular can be a pretty high stakes, very focusing moment when you're gonna launch that thing on a rocket going yeah. up and they've been known they can just blow up sometimes or they go off and they never call home again. Um, and not only I can't help but wonder sort of how yeah, then, will it feel as that countdown hits the last 10 seconds. And I can even add to that going seconds. in 50% of projects end in failure of, of space missions to Mars. Yes. So we are not naive about this. Are it you is building a, two units? We're, we're building the unit. Um, the it's, unit. Yes, the unit. <laughs> we're building one hope spacecraft. You can't have plenty of hope. <laughs> but we've put it all into one spacecraft. And the reason for that is that we're, we are in complete understanding of what the risks are, but to have such monumental shifts and changes in culture and understanding, to make a bold statement about the, the, the energy and the positive energy that youth could, could work on is, is not something that you can make with a mere very small project that is comfortable to do, that does not push boundaries. Uh, if you've read anything about the UAE, we, we are there to push boundaries. And as His Highness said about the issue of if this spacecraft goes up, there's an issue um, along the way. The real investment is in every single person that you saw in the picture there. It's in the knowledge that was cultivated. It's in the international relations that the UAE has gathered from that. And it's about how we push the boundaries of science and exploration. Which suggests that if the countdown gets to T minus one second, maybe the project will have come to fruition no matter what happens a second every, later. Every year um, there are several success stories both here in the community and with the development of this spacecraft. Uh, we outreach to all members of the community. We have our outreach team is very dedicated to students from three years old all the way to graduate and postgraduate students. Um, we see an impact in the society today. We see people that have aspirations that they didn't before and they see the future in, through a different lens, especially children. Got it. Just so we can set our calendar entry, is there a already a time that we should be ready to be in our live streams so to the, watch the launch? So we have a few weeks of a launch window, window and that starts on the 14th of July, 2020. Wonderful. We shall check in again then, if not awesome. sooner. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> I'm now pleased to introduce Minister Omar bin Sultan al Alama, the Minister of, Sci of State, Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, please. And uh, before your presentation begins, uh, just curious, what impelled you towards AI? When was the moment when among all the different things you thought you might be doing, artificial intelligence was what seized your attention? 
So I wasn't working towards becoming a thought leader or a government leader in artificial intelligence. I was actually very passionate about it. I was truly concerned, but I saw the opportunities as well. I was very focused on governance. And that's why I you know, chose my career path and I worked towards it. And I think the leadership saw the passion and they saw the drive and they thought this person is someone that can take the technology forward, take us forward in that regard. And I hopefully will be able to do that. Got it. Well, love to hear about how it's been going and we'll ask some questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure being uh, here with you today. I would like to start off by actually starting where my colleague ended. When we talk about youth, I think youth are a blessing in the Middle East and maybe a challenge in some parts of the Middle East that we have to look at and we have to try to you know, work towards really enabling and empowering. In the Middle East, we have 30% of our youth are unemployed. These 30% of the youth are the power that will propel governments forward. They're also the power that can bring governments down. We've seen that in the Arab Spring, and we've seen that throughout the whole world. Now, these youth are also an opportunity. We have 108, or more than 108 million youth in our region. This opportunity actually is an opportunity that plays directly with the role that I'm playing in, which is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is going to disrupt jobs. It's going to change lives. And it's going to create opportunities. Some people estimate it to be between 10 to $100 trillion if you look at artificial general intelligence. It's going to re-transform our economies in our countries. Now, this number, the 108 million, are 108 million people that we can re-transform and repurpose with just some training and some insight and some hope to make them into experts in this field and thought leaders that can transform the future. Now, some of you might ask, why should we care? Why is it our role at UAE to look at these youth and to look at the opportunities and create a better future for them? The answer is quite simple. You have two scenarios, one of which that 30% becomes 50% and 80%, and you will see them at the doorsteps of Europe and America and all other countries because they will be striving for hope. This is something that we're not just seeing in the UAE or in the region, we'll see it globally. If youth across the world are not enabled and they're not trained, they will not have hope and that will make them rebel. The other scenario is what we're trying to hope to achieve. It's a scenario wherein we create better futures for them, wherein we train them to become the pioneers of the future. We want 100 Mark Zuckerberg out of the 108 million youth that we have. We want 1,000 uh, Elon Musks and we can achieve that. I think artificial intelligence can actually create a future that makes them more thought leaders and make them more pioneers in that regard. When talking about artificial intelligence, many people ask me, why does the UAE government actually go into this domain and why are we even looking at it? And our answer is, if we look at it in a matrix perspective, if we just draw it out, what are the possible futures if we generalize artificial intelligence as a technology? There are four possibilities. The first is that artificial intelligence is a technology that harms us, it's a bad technology, but we can't control it. So this is like nuclear waste, for example. Nuclear waste is something that can harm us, but we can contain it and we can control it. The second possibility or the second scenario is a scenario where artificial intelligence actually harms us and it's bad for us and we cannot control it. That's the apocalyptic scenario that Elon Musk is talking about, Stephen Hawking is talking about, and many of the thought, leadership, uh, thought leaders are actually scared of. Now, the scenarios that we are interested in as the UAE are the scenarios on the right. The scenario of artificial intelligence being good and is something that we can control. Artificial intelligence becoming the next frontier for humanity. Or a scenario that we are envisioning as well, which is something very similar to the internet, is artificial intelligence being a technology that is good for us, but we cannot control it. No one controls the internet today, and that's a good thing. We see all the knowledge that's created, we see all the content that's created, and once we look at this chart, we understand that governments need to talk about this today. They cannot afford to wait until the future to actually do something about it. Now, many people ask me as well, is, as a government official working in this domain, what would you do and how can you govern artificial intelligence? I think governing artificial intelligence is a very complex task. Um, I was given a challenge and hopefully we'll be able to overcome it, but it's not something that governments can do on their own. Uh, the forefront of artificial intelligence is not in governments today. It's actually in the private sector, it's with Google and Facebook and Amazon, and they're using it to transform services, to transform lives, and to really create the, the things that we cannot let go of today. Our smartphones today are even closer to us than our loved ones. So we know that artificial intelligence is going to be something that we need to look at. 
The other thing, and this is the most important, uh, important uh, factor, is that artificial intelligence needs data. And the private sector actually you know, collects data from their, from their applications and their softwares, but we choose to opt in or opt out. With government, we do not choose to opt in or to opt out. We use the services, whether we like it or not. And I think the opportunity for governments to collect the data and to create such a wealth of knowledge that we can use to make people's lives better, to improve the lives of seven billion citizens, is something that can be done today. Finally, you know, people might ask about the region. So talking about the Middle East region, what is the United Arab Emirates doing? Um, and, to and, and talking about the technology and talking about artificial intelligence and in a broader context. What we see ourselves doing is we actually are coding hope. We are instilling hope in the grains of our region. Our region is actually what gave the world the algorithm. We are at the foundation level of this technology. And in the UAE, we launched an initiative to train one million people how to code. We're teaching kids how to code in schools. And we are also enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to come and bring their technologies and to accelerate them in the United Arab Emirates. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you in Dubai. Thank you. I, I find the matrix there particularly uh, provocative. And when I think of the corner you mentioned here of good without control, my guess is that uh, people like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and maybe Stephen Hawking think of themselves as pretty much good without control. They don't see much limit, uh, sometimes even by governments. And I'm wondering if we find a way, if there is a way to empower youth to be thinking out of the box, doing the kinds of advancements that you want to see that nobody yet knows the path scientifically forward yet, that may be a generation of people who, like Elon Musk, are iconoclastic, who have issues with authority sometimes, they're contrarian. I feel like I'm describing half the academics in the world. And there are times when that kind of attitude, the outspokenness, that can run into trouble from a governance perspective. There's stuff that might even be deemed criminal uh, within a given governance system. And I'm curious how you're thinking about that. Is the idea that we can be unleashing new forms of governance and governance that maybe is a little more tolerant of those who are not down with the official program, or is the idea to cultivate this within that pre-existing format? So just to go back to your point, I think when you look at the matrix, it's actually a matrix about the possibilities for the technology to impact us. Yes, now, of course. How we govern it is something that governments will have to choose and work on. Some governments might be very tight on it. China, for example, on the internet is extremely tight in their governance. Yes. And they have certain positive results and certain maybe negative results if, if you'd like to see that. Yes. But the point being is that the technology as a whole, we see it as being quite positive. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the matrix as a whole, three actually of the four possible scenarios are actually quite positive. If it's bad, but we can control it, that's actually positive for us. We know that we can control the technology and we can create a positive future. If it's good and we can't control it, then that's a good uh, case scenario. And then the final scenario, which is good, but we can't control it, is also something that we would actually find to be good. I so think you're saying our odds are three out of four? It, it, not, not necessarily, because yes. the weight of each one of these boxes is not equal. Of course. So maybe you know, bad with no control might be bigger in terms of weight, but the possibilities are there. There are possibilities for artificial intelligence to be very positive. I do share some concerns with some of the thought leaders that are out there, but I think that they jump to conclusions by seeing the trajectory. The world changes, governments change, um, you know, research changes. I think our imagination sometimes drives us, science fiction maybe drives us towards seeing the negative uh, point of view. But I think the positive is quite uh, much bigger. Bringing us back not only to the form of our youth, but of hope. Yes. Thank exactly. you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> For our third and final presentation, we have Minister Hessa bint Aisa Bukhumaid, and she's the Minister of Community Development. Hessa, welcome. Thank you so much. And tell us a little bit just about, before your presentation, your path, how did you become the Minister of Community Development? Well, um, uh, somehow, good, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I don't think we believe in coincidence. I think um, things happen for a reason. And um, my career in the government of the United Arab Emirates goes back to uh, more than 11 years working at the Prime Minister office and understanding exactly where this government is, is heading, where this government is actually going and constantly being pushed not to give the extra mile, to give the extra and extra and the third and fourth and 10 mile. 
Um, an agile government is basically what probably describes the government of the United Arab Emirates. Us being working uh, today on a specific project and then um, in two weeks time the project is delivered and then you jump into a totally different uh, background, I mean a, a totally different field. My, my background comes from excellence, comes from government uh, services improvement, comes a little bit here and there with a lot of changes and then here I am, I end up with the most uh, dear part uh, or topic to my heart, which is community development. Um, yeah. Well, let's That's hear about it. it. Thank you very <laughs> sure, much. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to, uh, to this special uh, presentation about the United Arab Emirates. Um, and again, tapping on what uh, Sara and Omar have been saying, let's talk a little bit about the history of the United Arab Emirates, going back to 1971, when the, when the, when the country was just established. Back at then, uh, can anyone believe or even imagine that we had some, some sort less than 20 hospitals uh, covering the whole United Arab Emirates? And now while we're speaking, we've got more than 126 hospitals, both private and, 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 uh, private and uh, public uh, hospitals covering and improving the healthcare in the United Arab Emirates. Um, a lot of other sectors, such as education, such as economy, te telecommunication, water and, and energy, and, and even technologies right now, as, as we've been hearing, are all the main sectors that the United Arab Emirates government have decided to, to take the pioneering seat and to, to actually go forward with that. Um, if we talk about education and we go back to 1971, Less than 60,000 students were in schools. And as we're talking now, we've got more than 1 million students in their classrooms. Um, the, num the, the years of the United Arab Emirates is quite uh, small compared to other uh, countries around the world. But the technological advancements that the country and the, co the government have decided to tap on, to utilize, to, to get us where we are here is huge. Um, with, with that, let's talk a little bit about um, how the United Arab Emirates actually, uh, as a government, was able to, to move um, through all these technological advancements. We're talking about uh, the year of 2000, where the government have announced the electronic government, which was, which was basically uh, the use of ICT to provide access to government public policies and public services. That's back in 2000. And then 13 years down the road, in 2013, uh, there was a big, huge annou announcement of shifting from the, go the electronic government to the mobile government. And then His Highness at back at then, being, uh, being him so competitive, gave everyone a challenge of two years to migrate um, to, to, the, to, M to the M government. When we say migrate, we talk about migrating systems, infrastructure, people, mindsets, everything. You, you, you just mentioned it. Um, at the core of this um, improvement, we're talking about government services, which is dear to people, because we are here as a government to serve people. We are here for them. We were here to listen to them. We are here to co-create with them. And that's what happened again in, in 2017, where the artificial intelligence was hugely announced being the new shift in the government as well. The fourth industrial revolution, again, with, with the full strategy of that being uh, uh, proposed and being also uh, announced, uh, which basically have the six main Pillars. One of them is at as, as its core, which is human, security, experience. Let's talk about productivity as well. And from there, uh, the fourth industrial revolution with all the technological uh, aspects that comes around it is, is a great, we believe that it's a great opportunity for us to take our achievements and technological achievements even further and further. Now, how will all these technological advancements help us as a community? And what do we believe as a community? We at the United Arab Emirates back at home believe that a happy community is a healthy community. A healthy community is, again, is a happy community. And how can we can translate this in public policies? How can we translate it in, in, in laws, whether they're federal or local? How can we translate this philosophy and this mindset into government services that is being provided to each and every person? The, this all goes back to the core of everything that we're doing, which is human being. We are here to ensure a healthy and happy lifestyle for our people. 
Um, this has been translated into many policies. One of, one of them is to appoint uh, the first minister around the world for happiness. Again, happiness and well-being. And now we're talking about uh, minister of tolerance. Everything goes back to creating this very strong community and cohesion, cohesiveness among um, all government, uh, all um, society, members of the society. Uh, both of my colleagues, Omar and Sarah, have talked about youth. But us, uh, back, uh, back at home in the United Arab Emirates, we also focus a lot around all aspects of, uh, of the community. We, we care about the seniors, the elderly. Uh, as a matter of fact, two days back, we had the first of its kind uh, hackathon for our seniors, where um, surprisingly, we got them all on board. We did a little bit of research here and there with them. And then we started the day at 9.30 AM, one full shift until 6 p.m. and they're all there, um, healthy, kicking, um, I mean, happily co-creating with the community, with the, with the government, the best services to be provided to them. Co-creating with us the best policies that they require. And most importantly, we look up to our seniors as, as our government advisors, basically. Uh, we want them to be always uh, included, and, that, and that's what, what makes a healthy and a happy community, the, ho the cohesiveness of all members. Again, um, this happy um, uh, picture of a family um, is basically what is, um, is on our top agenda. So uh, the national agenda has uh, a lot of uh, KPIs right now that we actually follow up. One of the most important them is the Human Development Index, the Happiness Index. We also talk about uh, Social Cohesion Index and most importantly, Family Cohesion Index. So uh, we have the privilege of using the best technologies around the world to ensure that we are providing the best services, the best policies, and the best lifestyle for our people and people who live on the United Arab Emirates and in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Hessa. My guess is there's another minister responsible for this, but maybe that's why I can ask you. Sure. Uh, primary education. What's your sense of its state right now, and is there a very different place you imagine you'd like to take it in the next 10, 20, 30 years? What would the ideal educational experience be for a young person that you're hoping one day sure. will be part of the, uh, especially the science and technological future? Well, as a matter of. of fact, when we talk about education in the United Arab Emirates, we have dedicated three ministers for the topic and the concept of, uh, of education. Uh, we are actually very lucky to have one of our ministers who's, who's handling the education here with us, uh, with an, basically there, the, the person in green, the, the beautiful lady in green. Um, <laughs> but if I may quickly answer. That's a answer. wonderful title, and I should say, <laughs> we have in, in, in academia, we have a teacher to student ratio. I love the minister to citizen ratio <laughs> as a good measure of where the emphasis is. Absolutely. Well, yes. primary education is one of the our top, uh, top um, uh, topics when we talk about the UAE national agenda. Uh, ensuring that our kids and our youth get the best uh, uh, education, ensuring that the, um, the the, 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 um, ensuring that the, the rates of kids, I mean, of course, literacy rate now in the United Arab Emirates is, is, is basically more, uh, it comes around 95%, which basically is nothing compared to um, what it used to be in 1971, which was around 75, 57%. And um, the primary education is basically um, why is it as a top of our priority and what are we doing towards it? We are actually injecting um, um, the best technologies, artificial intelligence, and we're, we're actually discussing and looking forward of how can we ensure that our curriculum right now is at, uh, is at its best of uh, state. Um, the UAE uh, Centennial 2071 has one of its main um, uh, Basically, one of one of the main uh, sectors that we're focusing on is to have the best education in the world. Um, the vision of the United Arab Emirates 2021, as well, again, is to be providing the best uh, uh, education to our people. It's not only the matter of primary education. We also talk about education. We talk about pre kgs as well, and we also talk about uh, post education, which which all comes into um, the full uh, ecosystem. Got it. Um, I think we can bring some chairs up so that all three of our speakers can, uh, uh, I was going to say relax at the front of the room, <laughs> I don't know how relaxing it is, but can be here. And I'm curious if there are questions from the audience that 
you'd like to put before folks. As you are thinking about that, and as the chairs are being arranged, uh, maybe I can ask you all, tell me about a regional strategy. You mentioned you wanted to be pioneering. What's the vision for the region that you all see? And please feel free to have, sure. a, have a seat. Thanks. And I don't know who among you wants to take a swing at that. You have, uh, since we have to sit in the front of the room, you need to do too. Uh huh. The spotlight is shared here. I cannot reject an invitation. We'll see how it affects my happiness. If you allow me to, to answer yes, the please, question, Omar. I think uh, with regards to regional strategies, it really depends on the sector. You can't really intrude in other countries' you know, privacy with regards to what they're doing, but there are certain sectors that are imperative for governments to work together on. Artificial intelligence, for example, is one of these sectors. Yes. It's going to you know, cross borders, it's going to cross governments, and this is something that all governments need to come together and work on. What we are doing in terms of our strategy is we're bringing all governments that are interested from around the world, so not just the region, to come together and to put together a roadmap for other governments and for themselves to follow with regards to governing AI to ensure that there is no, no job, job displacement, that there is no harm, there's no, no autonomous weapons. So we're looking at the sectors that are very sensitive, but at the same time need to have a global coalition in that front. We have the same when it comes to happiness. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the Minister of Happiness, but uh, the Minister of Happiness does have a coalition on happiness that brings together ministers from around the world, puts that at the top of their agenda, and that's what we focus on. Now, as a government, we have a calling, and our calling is to try to improve the state of every you know, a citizen's life to try to improve the state of the world in, in a good way. So very similar to the World Economic Forum's uh, calling. And we do it in whatever we can do. We yes. are open and we share with everyone. Yes. So to add on top of that, yes. we in the UAE are a sovereign nation. And we believe in the sovereignty of other nations too. The best that we can do in the region is to set an example that could be emulated positively across the region. Um, and that is what is the large portfolio of this government um, is doing and the agility and, and the pace of change that the government is willing to adapt. That transformation of the understanding of the role of government um, is what we hope to project to, uh, to an entire region. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Right up here, and, uh, if you want to wait for the microphone since we're broadcasting. And feel free, if you like, to tell us who you are. Thank you very much. I'm Monica Maggioni. I'm the president of Italian Television. I was very impressed by your presentations outstanding presentations, but my question here is uh, uh, what is the ratio of sustainability, of economic sustainability of these kind of projects? Because I mean, most of our governments here in Europe would like to announce these kind of fantastic projects, but then it comes the problem of sustainability. So what is the, the possibility to be sustainable on the long run with this kind of project? At least one of these projects could be characterized uh, with the colloquialism of moonshot, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And this is a lot of money up front, and then the countdown, and we say at T minus one, it all worked, and then hope that a second later, yeah. it worked even more. Um, and so, yeah, how sustainable could I, is could it? I, yeah, sure. Could you elaborate on uh, what you mean by sustainability? I, we've been using sustainability across all sectors, so it would be good to, to have an understanding. Basically, are you going to have enough money to sustain this in uh, centuries, not years or decades? Centuries. <laughs> <laughs> if I may. No, when it comes to Europe, we, we always project ourselves on that. Sure. On well, um, if I may, um, if you may allow me, um, when, when, it, when, when we talk about sustainability, we talk about a sustainable project that is being launched and then people are actually feeling the effect, the impact about it, and then the rollout of it so, so that we increase the scope of it. So that's, um, I think uh, we're, we're very lucky to have a very supportive and a very um, a keen leadership that uh, that are on top of things first of all secondly if an announcement goes out and especially if it's a, it's a national um, announcement uh, with such a great project that will will actually eradicate and change things radically and then uh, in the government such as the m government 2013 uh, 2015 again we were talking about the um, artificial intelligence and so forth um, we use something uh, we are a lot we're using the carrot and the sticks a lot uh, phenomena, which basically we have a leadership that follow up uh, uh, very closely using KPIs, using uh, social media to ensure that everyone is on board, everyone is aware, and everyone is engaged. Everyone is co-creating 
as well with the, com with, with, with the government of what is going to be delivered and how to sustain it later on. Can I just yes. add to this? I, I think we're at a point in our you know, time as human beings, as governments, that we can't afford to wait and see what happens. And we've seen this with the private sector very clearly. You've seen Kodak being the biggest company on earth. And today, you know, Instagram, which is just an app, surpasses it by a thousand folds. And we've seen it with many, many other examples. Now, governments, for example, need to be agile as well. The world is changing. Uh, just seven years ago, the world was not the way that it is today. Not every policy needs to have billions of dollars behind them. So, for example, having a policy that governs artificial intelligence might not cost the government anything might give the private sector a playground to come and you know, test their, their technology, and might improve the lives of citizens. That might have a lot of positive economic returns on the government. So it all depends on how you plan your future. What we do is we have two things. I think the first is our, our resources are the youth and, and the talent that we have internally. And the second, it's the foresight of our government and our leadership. If you have foresight, you can put the plans that will improve the lives of everyone. Now, our friend from Italy asked a question bringing the European frame. I can't help but bring an American frame where uh, at the moment we have lots of debates internally about citizen and non-citizen, lots about that. We may hear about that uh, on Friday uh, from our president. And I don't know uh, how you all are thinking about when you look at all of the metrics you're setting up, the progress, the aspirations, the hope, how thick is the line between citizen and non-citizen? Science, science is, in, if you pick any sector under the sun, science is the most inclusive. It's driven by exploration, regardless of who the human is that's doing the exploration. Um, and that is, is the large driver of the perspective that the UAE is coming on. We have over 200 nationalities coexisting yes. in one area um, with different religions, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic understandings. And it works. And it's transforming that into a test bed for future development of a nation, future development of technologies, future development of science. Yes, Omar. So just with, with regards to that, I think if you go into the streets, you can't really divide between a citizen and non-citizen. Everyone's mm -hmm. walking, everyone's living and thriving. Governments need to think holistically. At the end of the day, whatever is good for the citizen would be good for the person using the streets and using the service. What we look at, you know, in terms of a government, we look at people in the country are people who are going to be using the services, they're going to be using the things that the government are going to regulate and going to govern. So we don't really differentiate between citizen and non-citizen. We don't differentiate between tourists and residents. At the end of the day, everyone is there to thrive and to live in a, in a peaceful life. I think that's also one reason why we have a minister for tolerance. Definitely. Uh, tolerance is actually not differentiating between citizen and non-citizen. It's not differentiating between tourists and you know, residents. And we've seen the success of that. The fruits are there for everyone to, to see. And it's at the heart of the unity. That's what makes the United Arab Emirates, basically. Well, we have today's youth, and uh, they will be tomorrow's adults, perhaps living in a city like this. <laughs> there may be some good with control traffic management for yeah. the aerial vehicles. <laughs> uh, but for the rest, uh, here is to hope and to good without much need for control, if we, mm -hmm. can, uh, if we can pull that off. I'm sorry, sure. we're out of time. I see Thank some you. other questions emerging. I hope there'll be a chance to speak informally afterwards. Thank you all Thank so you. much for a wonderful Thank session. You.